Okay, everyone, welcome to the second panel here, uh, Planetary Fixity and Flows, Cheapening of Water and Land. Uh, I'm Dane Fian, I'll be presiding over this. We have uh, some great presenters here. Uh, our first presenter is Elizabeth Miller, Extractivism and the Energy Utopia, 1870 to 1910. So this paper is taken from a project that I'm working on about mineral extraction in the environmental imaginary in the long 19th century, and I'm specializing, uh, or I'm looking specifically at uh, the British Empire, the British Imperial world. So that's just to kind of give you a sense of the context from which this is coming. Okay. Subsurface extraction became a race to the bottom under the global force of 19th century industrialism. From metals to minerals to coal, the steam engine and other new technologies, including new explosives and new means of conveying mined materials, contributed to an unprecedented scale of operations and the global establishment of an extractivist version of ecological imperialism. With the drainage power that steam afforded, deeper mines could now be dug, enabling entirely new dimensions of depth in extractive industry. In the sacrifice zones of Britain and its empire, industrial terraforming pulverized the land, casting up at least as much waste and damage as it did treasure. So extensive a transformation was this rush into the Earth's subsurface that it remains geologically legible today. As Jan Salasiewicz, chair of the Anthropocene Working Group, has written with Colin Waters and Mark Williams, quote, the extensive exploitation of the subsurface environment that commenced with the British Industrial Revolution is an anthropogenic phenomenon with what they say is no analog in the Earth's 4.6 billion year history. Such changes are easily neglected, the authors write, quote, out of sight, out of mind, despite the fact that they are, quote, permanent on any kind of human time scale and of long duration even geologically. If mining, despite its massive environmental footprint, is easily ignored and easily overlooked, this is at least in part by design. As Stephanie Lynn Managera writes, quote, extractivism means, among other things, abstraction. If De Beers wants to remind us that a diamond is forever, they do not want to remind us that the big hole they dug in South Africa in the late 19th century will also last forever. The material conditions of underground mining do resist representation. It's difficult to see underground and difficult to obtain access. But such difficulties also suit a broader desire to overlook the conditions of extractive labor. While inspection of Britain's mines was legally required by the 1860 Mines Inspection Act, Marx notes in volume one of Capital that, quote, this act was a complete dead letter owing to the ridiculously small number of inspectors and the meagerness of their powers. In 1865, he says, quote, there were 3,217 coal, mile, coal mines in Great Britain and 12 inspectors. He quotes one miner who says, the inspector has been down just once in the pit and it has been going on seven years. Concealment, in other words, is both political practice and material circumstance. As this suggests, the 19th century saw the birth not only of modern extraction in its industrial forms, but of modern extractivism the political, economic, ecological, and social relations bound up in the mining of underground resources. Deepesh Chakrabarty argues in the climate of history that, quote, the mansion of modern freedoms stands on an ever-expanding base of fossil fuel use. And his claim could be extended beyond consumption to take in labor, too. For miners' unions, as many critics have noted at this point, played a crucial role in the rise of labor, such that by the early 20th century, Extractivism and petrosocialism were to some extent entrenched. The rise of an anti-extractivist left has been an ongoing project since, tasked with reimagining the goal of left politics. Thea Rio Francos describes a rift in the contemporary Latin American left around the issue between an old left desire to nationalize the mines and distribute the profits, and a new political horizon that strives for what she calls reciprocal collaboration in social natural relations. Motivated by our urgent need for <clears throat> new horizons and new imaginaries, this paper looks back to utopian fiction from the era when extractivist path dependency could be said to have hardened, 1870 to 1910. 
Jason Moore describes the post-1870 period as an era of peak appropriation enabled by coal in the colonies, just on the other side of what he identifies as a historical tipping point when, quote, capitalism as a planetary system became possible through the production of a globe-encircling railroad and steamship network. Planetary work and energy were appropriated on an unprecedented scale. This was also, relatedly, the peak era of utopian fiction, when such influential classics as Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward from 1888 and William Morris's News for Nowhere from 1890 offered political inspiration for activists and readers alike. As Matthew Beaumont has written in his work on utopia, utopian fiction, quote, at the end of the 19th century, a self-consciously utopian political discourse pro proliferated across English, lang English language literature with, quote, hundreds of fantastic novels, periodical essays, and polemical pamphlets, each one prophesying a future society from whose perspective the present state of affairs seemed manifestly unsatisfactory. Beaumont reads this utopian impulse as a structure of feeling in Raymond Williams' sense, symptomatic of an emergent consciousness. We might connect this utopian longing to the emergence of a global socialist discourse in the era of the First International, or to the extreme in income inequality of the Gilded Age. But I, also want, but I want to suggest today that this utopian impulse might also speak to an emergent anti-extractivism, a latent sense of disquiet that the circuits of capital have been had become so beholden to stocks of underground energy. For many of this era's utopias are energy utopias that depict energy transition as the source of social transformation. My focus in this brief talk will be three energy utopias published in Britain and its empire. Edward Bulwer Lytton's The Coming Race from 1871, William Morris's News for Nowhere from 1890, and Rokeya Sakawa Busan's feminist utopia Sultana's Dream from 1905. Written in an era of exponential growth, these three speculative fictions anticipate the drawbacks of, of appropriation on such a scale. They imagine new forms of energy that do not require underground extraction, moving beyond the organizing principles of labor under fossil capitalism. And yet, none are able to imagine civilization proceeding without a new energy source to replace fossil fuels. I'll begin with Edward Bulwer Lytton's novel Coming Race, which is part of a subgenre of speculative fiction known as hollow earth fiction, narratives that take place in imaginary worlds underground and borrow from scientific speculation about the composition of the earth's interior. The Coming Race peels back the surface layer of the planet to imaginatively reveal an underground frontier, one that does not consist of mineral resources alone. Here we find the underground civilization of the Vril Yah who are named for their mysterious energy source, which is called Vril. Vril, as the narrator explains, oh, my slide came out a little weird here, uh, has no, Vril, the narrator tells us, has no exact synonym in English, but lies somewhere between electricity and mesmerism. It requires no extraction and is subject to no exhaustion, enabling good quality of life and reduced labor demands, such that most of the Vril Ya retire in early adulthood to a life of leisure pursuits. The conceit of an entire civilization down to its social and political structures emerging as superstructure, Vril Ya, from an energy base, Vril, suggests how the coming race theorizes the determinant powers of energy regimes. Vril serves as what Darko Suvin has called narrative validation, that which provides a principle of believability in speculative fiction. In this case, a new energy source that explains the profound social differences exhibited by the Vril Ya. For not only are the Brillion named for their energy source, their very bodies have adapted to it. A, quote, visible nerve in their wrists and hands has slowly developed in the course of generations, a Lamarckian inheritance that promotes their mastery of Brill's agencies. What does such figuration suggest by contrast about humans' adaptation to fossil fuels? Natural selection has not yet wedded us to our energy cho choices in this narrative, and extraction-based life, especially at the time of this novel's publication, is still a mere blip in the evolutionary time scale. And yet, in imagining that a species might evolve according to the agencies and affordances of an energy regime, <clears throat> of an energy regime the coming race suggests that human life could be more bound to its fuel sources than we realize. 
Like the coming race, William Morris's News for Nowhere is also an energy utopia, but one that depicts a, quote, epoch of rest, as its subtitle puts it, a post-carbon imaginary that reaches beyond frenetic modernity and the terrible labors of extraction-based life. If Bulwer imagines liberation as freedom from work, a freedom enabled by drill, Morris imagines liberation as pleasure in work, a pleasure enabled by social arrangements that promote unalienated labor. Morris's post-industrial, post-capitalist utopia has practically done away with fossil energy altogether, and its residents live happily on their own steam for the most part. The novel opens with our narrator riding London's Underground Railway, which in 1890 was a virtual hellscape of smoke. No wonder when he wakes the next morning in the socialist future, the clean environment is one of the first things he notices. How clear the water is this morning, he says of the Thames. Later, he passes a workshop and marvels at the lack of smoke. Smoke, another character asks. Why should you see smoke? Nowhere has experienced, we learn, quote, the great change in the use of mechanical force, an event that parallels the society's other great change, the socialist revolution. While the revolution is recounted in copious detail in the novel, the great change in the use of mechanical force remains mostly unexplained, though we do know that it entailed a drastic reduction in the use of fossil fuels. Still, a residue of extractivism persists, troublingly, in the novel's imaginary, suggesting Morris's difficulty thinking past it. Quote, whatever coal or mineral we need is brought to grass and sent whither it is needed with as little as possible of dirt, confusion, and the distressing of quiet people's lives. Note how the passage abstracts nowhere's extractive labor, limited though it is, through the use of passive voice, is brought to grass. Consu and consumption is abstracted as well, is needed. Such glossing over of energy's materiality can similarly be felt with respect to nowhere's new energy source, a clean, mysterious power that propels the force barges on the river, which have replaced the steamships. This power is, the narrator tells us, too complicated to explain. The novel remains littered then with extraction's remainders, even as it recognizes that a social break away from capitalism will also facilitate a break from fossil energy. The last text I will discuss is Sultana's Dream, a feminist energy utopia originally published in the Indian Ladies Magazine, an English language periodical that was based in Madras, India. The story would later be published as a book in Calcutta in 1908. In the gender-reversed utopian world of Ladyland that Hussam depicts, men live in Purda while women govern and maintain social life. The women manage to run the country on two hours of work a day, leaving plenty of time for leisure pursuits. When the narrator asks how this is so, her guide explains that women, unlike men, don't, quote, waste six hours a day in sheer smoking, a humorous reference that also reminds us that smoke is precisely what is missing in this utopia. For the energy basis of Ladyland is solar power, extractionless, and presented here as capable of transforming gendered social relations entirely. Because underground extraction was mostly a male form of labor, it follows that a feminist utopia must be differently powered. Female underground mine labor was legally prohibited in Britain following the 1842 Mines and Collieries Act, but it was, the situation was less clear in the Indian Raj. In India, an inspector of mines was not appointed until 1894, which was almost 50 years after Britain. In his first annual report, the inspector emphasized that there were no legal principles in place in India to address, quote, female labor in the underground workings of mines. He reported that some Indian mines employed women underground carrying coals, but that they were a minority of the working population. This is a key consideration in analyzing the solar power imaginary of Sultana's dream, I think. It's a story that suggests how gendered social hierarchies are underlaid by the labor and energy demands of fossil capitalism. Hussan's narrator is amazed that Ladyland has learned how to, quote, gather up and store sun heat. But while solar power may have seemed magical to some readers when this story appeared, it did have a theoretical and practical basis in contemporary scientific discourse. Such plausibility distinguishes Hassan's solar power from the more fantastical fuels of the coming race or loose for nowhere. But techno-utopianism is not all Ladyland offers as a remedy to industrial extractivism. 
As the Queen of Ladyland explains, quote, we do not covet other people's land. We do not fight for a piece of diamond. The story connects extraction not only to energy, but to war and conflict, aspects of modern extractivism that Lady Land has dug itself out from. If imaginative literature is a privileged site for identifying myths of energy and patterns of meaning making as they relate to environment and history, we can see in this era's utopian narratives an effort both to expand our stories of what is possible and to reassert old patterns under new conditions. By the early 20th century, the British Empire was a giant extracted machine amped up on fossil fuels and powered by exploited labor at home and abroad. But in the era of that machine's painful birth, extractivism was only just hardening in the imperial imaginary such that we could see another horizon of possibility, one whose limits are as illuminating as its dreams. Thank you.